Hey guys, Corth Camel ADV. Uh, this is episode two for our bike lean thing. We're gonna call it the Claw Camel Lean Angle Weight. Um, we put the video out and we got lots of replies and lots of questions and some of the replies are really good. Hey man, I can't wait to see your series. And some of the replies are hilarious. Hey, you're a an idiot and you don't know what you're talking about. Stop trying to teach people, blah, blah, blah. We're not trying to teach anybody anything. Um, we're asking questions during conversations. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Uh, I cannot stress this enough. We're two dudes hanging out in the shop, um, trying to wrap our heads around this and have fun, uh, do a cool project. I need to clear up a couple of things because I feel like uh, we weren't super clear on the first video of me specifically. We are tying the bike in to the jig and we are pulling off of the halo. Um, we're not pulling off of the bike because we don't have any uh, consistent points. So that's why we were going from this bike to that bike and saying, hey, we could pull from here, we could pull from here, um, kind of showing you that there's, there's nothing universal on any of these bikes. Uh, so we needed to standardize where we're pulling from, which is what we've got with the arms here. And then of course we're securing it with the straps. Uh, a few comments about why don't you pull off of the axles, why didn't you secure the bike to the jig with the axles, just put a piece of ready rod through the hollow axle. Um, that bike doesn't have a hollow axle, front or rear. The T7 does not have a hollow axle on the rear. Single-sided swing arm bikes are 1200GS, um, you know, Super Tenray. Uh, they don't have rear axles that we can do that to. There's no standard size there. So we would be machining parts for every bike and that defeats if, if it's not quick and easy to do, we're just not going to do it. Um, we can't be bringing bikes in. People are here waiting with their bike, whether it's a dealer or just, you know, somebody local that wants to, wants to play along with us here. Um, we can't be like, hey, give me like an hour. We're going to spin this up and we're going to see whether we can get it mounted. Uh, different widths and different heights. If it's got a 19 inch front or a 21 or it's got a 18 inch rear or a 17 and it's a street tire, it's knobbies. The height's different. The width is different. The length between them is different because of different wheelbases. So it's all really clunky. We have to be able to keep all of the jig and everything nice and tight to get the results that we want. So that's why we came up with the crisscross strap method. Um, there are some things we need to fine tune. Uh, when we put the bike in here last time, we had the straps coming uh, over and down. The issue with that is as we strap the bike and there's more pressure on it as we lean, the bike is gonna drop in the suspension stroke a little bit uh, because the strap is kind of straight, trying to straighten out. And when it does that, it has to push the bike down to get that extra space. So we're lowering the center of gravity when we're doing it, we're, we're changing the results. So we uh, have got some L-Track. So this is L-Track. It's really easy to attach things. It's very strong. And it's gonna go on the inside arms of the jig. So we're gonna mount one of these, we might have to cut them down a little bit because they're going to interfere with the, uh, the sleeve. But we're going to have one on each side. So instead of tying down to the bottom piece here, we can put the anchors at a reasonable location, um, a little bit lower than 90, or a little bit lower than parallel to the top of the bike in here. And that's going to keep the, the downward pressure as the straps try and straighten out to a minimum. So in race cars, when you have four-point harnesses and five-point harnesses, uh, most racing organizations will have uh, a spec, a, a measurement, that when the strap comes over your shoulder, the location where it mounts can only be so many inches below your shoulder. And it's in the event of an accident when the, your, your, the G-forces are moving your body around and the straps are trying to straighten out, it puts a lot of pressure on your spine. Uh, so they need to be as close to... Uh, the same height as your shoulder or a little bit below but not too much and that's the same idea here we want to make sure that we're not artificially uh, we're not adding um, error uh, into into what we're doing so uh, a bunch more questions about uh, there's a way easier way to do this why don't you just put a scale on the ground and put the bar end on it and that will tell you how heavy the bike is to pick up which is great, um, how heavy to pick the bike up. That's a completely different thing than we're trying to measure. That measurement, that weight is, is really cool. Um, it's something that I hadn't really thought about. 
uh, and it's something that when we have all the bikes in here that we're, we'll probably measure and we'll add that uh, to the, the chart of information uh, because that is an important number when the bike's laid over how, how much weight is there to pick up. And that's gonna be different on an R1200 because you've got the cylinder sticking out so it only falls over so far. So then you would start your measurement with the cylinder just slightly off the ground. Um, but it's already, you know, it's already up say 30 degrees or uh, say a 790, 890 with the big tank lobes. That one, you know, if you prop the bike up so the tank's not in the ground, the weight on that bar end is gonna be less. Uh, than something like a T7 that lays flat. So when we have the bikes here, we will do our best to check that. I'm not sure that all of the dealers, uh, if they're bringing us bikes, that they're, they're going to let us take a $30,000 bike and lay it over on its side um, on the scale. We'll see if we can figure out a way to do it without scuffing stuff up, then I'm sure that they will be okay with that. So if we're not measuring pickup weight on the bike, what the hell are we doing? That's probably the question you have. Fair enough. When you get on a new bike that you've never ridden before, a big bike, I'm not talking about a dirt bike, but I'm talking about a big heavy bike, whether it's a 320 pound um, 690-701 or it's a 500 or 500 pound KLR, what, what do you do? What do you, when you get on the bike? Lean it. Everybody, everybody leans the bike back and forth a few degrees to get an idea of the weight, like how, how manageable is this bike, right? How likely am I to topple? Um, so the, the measuring off of the bar end to see how heavy it is to pick up, super important. Um, I'd rather just not drop the bike in the first place. And I know a lot of people are going to say, well, if you ride off road, you're going to drop your bike anyway. Uh, and I totally agree. I dump my bike constantly. Um, but we're looking at how manageable is this bike? When, when do people drop their bike the most? It's in the parking lot. It's in their garage. It's on their driveway. Uh, they're at a light, Ooh, and they fall over. It happens all the time. Of course, the the newer the rider, the more likely that is to happen. Uh, but that's kind of that's what we're testing here. Is the is essentially putting a number to the. Oh, it actually feels pretty good. So that's where we get with this, and that's where we're talking about 25 degrees and 45 degrees for fun. And we may decide that the number is not 25. It may be 30. It may be 22. We'll figure that out as we go. So that's 15 degrees, and I bet if we could get candid camera video um, of people doing this on the showroom floor at a bike show, I'm guessing 15 degrees either way is what most people are doing, which isn't a lot, um, but it's obviously where people are comfortable leaning a bike. Yeah. Um, and I'm like thinking people are losing the bike, they're dropping it at probably at 25 or 30, like 25 is getting down there. Okay. So that's 22.1, so halfway to 45. And I feel like- I feel like that's unrecoverable. I feel like, especially if there's any luggage on here, that at 22 degrees, like 25 for sure, most people are dropping their bike at 25 degrees. That's, so that's 26. Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like we need to, just take it off we need to drop some bikes, yeah. <laughs> just actually drop them in the, in the shop, like hold them up and then go, oh yeah, no, like this is, this is the point where you would drop it. Uh, so we're going to be doing some more changes here with where we're pulling from. Um, when we're pulling from the center, as the bike leans more, you can, you can watch the rope angle dip here as Matt lowers it. So relative to the height off the floor, uh, that's lowering. So we're losing mechanical advantage, we're losing leverage as it drops. So it's pulling on the scale harder than if it was staying at the higher height. So originally we were pulling from here, we were gonna put another L track on here and be pulling off of here. But because this is so far out from center, it, this starts low and then as this thing tips, it gets higher. So the mechanical advantage is better because we have more leverage. So the number actually ended up being quite a bit lower uh, if we're here than we are in the center. <laughs> so 
The only way to correct this so that this height doesn't lower as the bike dips, like I said, when we're out here, the height raises as we tip over, and in the middle, it dips, which is a problem. So as we move this thing closer out here, it gets more, uh, it, it changes less. Like there's almost eight inches of drop here from stationary to 45 degrees. And when, or six and a half, six and a half. Um, but when we have the rope over here, we gain six and a half. Uh, and then somewhere in the middle here, we get about three degrees of change, which is better. But if we put, we'll figure out the radius of the circle if it was spinning off of the spud. And then we could put in an arc in here, which will kind of roll the rope in. And that will keep this angle exactly the same. And we won't have the change in height. Yeah, so hopefully. Probably can't see with the lights. An accurate um, Yeah. An accurate BNI. Right. So now, so Matt and I argued about this quite a bit. Now that this is all hooked up, do you see why I put the post in at 45? Um, yes, I do. So this was a... Uh, this was one of our healthy discussion things here. Um, if we had put that post in straight up and down and we had the crane directly over, this force wants to equal out. So it would be trying to bend the top of the post over, which would press down really hard on this plate on the front edge and pull really hard pry those rear inserts up. So basically the entire load would be on those back two inserts. But when we put the post in at a 45, right now all four of those things, the load is the same on all of them. And it's trying to pull the post this direction, which means all four of those relatively, I'm sure that there's, you know, five, five 10% or whatever anyway. Um, but as we pull with this, you can see that it's not flexing at all it's and it's it's pulling in a straight line so this is like 16th wall uh two by two. Oh no it's one and a half so one and a half by um uh, 16th wall which if it was straight up and down and we had this the thing would be like bent over like a fishing rod i'm exaggerating of course but yeah it gets some flex there yeah no, i totally see it now yeah. so that's what we're kind of hoping to do here that we can, you know, we can say uh, the KLR at 20 degrees pulls this hard. And then you go, oh, well shit, the bike that I have now, I'm looking at the graph and I ride a, I ride a, a CRF 300L and it pulls this hard. So this one's comparable to that, which they're not going to be because this is significantly heavier, um, but that we can, uh, bikes have a different center of gravity and different overall weight. But if you have a low center of gravity and the overall weight is higher, the top heaviness may be equal to a much lighter bike that has a higher center of gravity. So that's all we're trying to do is just, if you're comfortable on bike X, you know, for the maneuverability part that you can look at it and go, oh, well, that one is very similar. Hey guys, thanks for watching. This is episode two of the Camel Claw. Um, so we probably got one more episode of messing around with the jig, with the pulleys and everything else to get it where we want it. And then we'll start tipping bikes and sharing numbers with you. Uh, we've got five bikes here. Uh, we've got uh, easy access to a few more. And then we'll start borrowing bikes from the dealer. And yeah, we'll get you uh, some interesting numbers. And I think, I think some of the numbers will be a bit surprising different bike to bike and, and what they're pulling. Oh shit, we gotta sort out luggage, don't we? Yeah. Right, and we gotta sort out soft luggage so we can do these numbers and then put the same weight on each bike for soft luggage and something for a top box, milk crate, whatever, um, to get that strapped on with X amount of weight on every bike. And you can see how much difference that adds with the luggage, especially when you're loaded high. Anyway, thanks for watching, have a great night. Ho <laughs> ho!